you probably have guessed I'm Dave Nichols. And uh, I'm going to give the first part of the workshop, and I'm going to focus on preclinical aspects. And when the program was printed up, Franz and I had really fleshed out sort of the approach. But he's going to focus more on clinical and assessment, and I'm going to give you some very basic stuff. So maybe I could see a show of hands. Who in here knows a reasonable amount of pharmacology, formal pharmacology? Wow. So, but who doesn't know any pharmacology? Well, for you three... I'm going to start very basically. And for the rest of you, you can just kind of ride along. Maybe there'll be some new stuff. But I, I want to get everybody on board so that uh, people who don't know any receptor pharmacology are up to speed. And when I talk about receptor effects, then they sort of know what I'm talking about. So this is very basic stuff. And for those of you that think you know pharmacology, maybe you'll find out you didn't know as much as you thought you knew. I don't know. Anyway. <clears throat> Now, this is a picture in the background from the Connectome project where they're actually mapping out connectivity. I just thought it was a pretty picture, but it's a part of the brain and it shows the direction that the axons flow. <coughs> okay, let's make sure I have my little clicker on, all this high-tech stuff. <coughs> so I'm talking about basic receptor pharmacology and a little bit of receptor signaling, and presumably this will take a total of around close to three hours, and then we'll take a break for lunch, whatever, and then Franz will come back and talk about clinical assessment and, and some of the things that go on in his lab in Switzerland. <clears throat> now, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about G-protein-coupled receptors. The target for psychedelics, the principal target is a serotonin 2A receptor, and it's a member of the type A family G-protein-coupled receptors. Uh, this is a simplified diagram sort of called a serpentine diagram because it snakes back and forth through the membrane. There are seven transmembrane helices, alpha helices. They're packed together in a bundle. And then the uh, intracellular loops, the carboxy terminus in the third loop, uh, basically interact with the G-protein, G, uh, G-binding protein, G protein, G-to-B-binding protein. <coughs> and when the ligand interacts with the receptor, it causes a conformational change, which leads to dissociation of G-proteins, and that's actually what produces the signals. This is a uh, more accurate representation. These are taken from crystal structures of actual receptors and G proteins. Uh, this is the G alpha subunit, and G beta and gamma basically stay together. And this is coupled to the bottom of the receptor. This is the actual, uh, again, this is from a crystal structure, so these represent the van der Waals surfaces and the approximate uh, span of the membrane. And what you can see in, in a lot of textbooks, they used to show these great big receptors with little G proteins, but actually the receptor itself is relatively small compared with the signaling components. So when the ligand binds, there's a conformational change in these loops that causes a dissociation of G alpha and beta gamma, and they go on and actually do the business of the receptor inside the cell. <clears throat> so I want to start by talking about measures of affinity. And uh, you may... Those of you who know pharmacology, maybe you're conversant with the concept of affinity and which numbers, big numbers, small numbers, what's higher affinity, etc. But basically, we're talking about the interaction of a drug with its receptor to form a transient, non-covalent drug receptor complex. And there's an association, association rate. Control the volume. <clears throat> there's an equilibrium association rate. Whoops. Ka and an equilibrium dissociation rate, Kd. So this is an equilibrium. And those of you who had chemistry, you know we have uh, two components on the left side, and then we have a single... We have a single component on the right side. And it's the relative ratios of those that determine the equilibrium. So we have a rate constant, Ka. This should be... I'll get my fingers right in a minute. This should be a little k. Ka for association, Kd for dissociation. <clears throat> and the way I teach this or taught this to pharmacy students is imagine that I have a drug that's a, a golf ball and the wall is a receptor. And so I throw the golf ball at the wall and it bounces right back off. We have a high association constant and a very high dissociation rate. Now I take a piece of soft modeling clay and I do the same thing. We have a high association and then it sticks to the wall. And we have a very slow dissociation. So that would be high affinity, and we can, you can imagine the wet clay is going to have higher affinity for the wall. So the same thing works with receptors. And these should be small k's. And then the large k is the ratio, ka over kd. This is the actual equilibrium association constant, which refers to affinity 
And for high affinity drugs, that constant is on typically 10 to the 9th, 10 to the 10th. <clears throat> but it's hard to measure that and not easy to work with. So what they usually do is the inverse, 1 over Ka. And so this is what they typically talk about. Kd is 1 over Ka. So if something, something has a uh, 1 nanomolar affinity, that's 1 times 10 to the minus 9th. So that's the Kd, whereas the affinity is 10 to the 9th, so it's the inverse. So when people say the affinity is 1 nanomolar, that means that 1 times 10 to the minus 9th molar, half of the receptors are occupied. And just stop me if I say something that I go too fast or lose somebody. <clears throat> and like all free, I don't know, speaker over here that I'm facing, oh, this one. <clears throat> Like all equilibrium constants, you can calculate a free energy of binding. Uh, sometimes people do that. So the Gibbs free energy delta G0 is minus RT natural log of Ka. And for typically for a drug that has an animal or affinity, you're looking at about 12 to 13 kilocalories per mole in energy. And a hydrogen bond between two hydrogen bonding groups would be somewhere between one and three kilocalories, just to give you an estimate. And this is non-covalent binding. It's reversible. It comes back off the receptor although the KDs can be very long. For example, things like ergotamine, have a, uh, it takes hours to reach an equilibrium and the drug will stay on there even after you wash the preparation off. So some drugs, like ergots for example, have very slow dissociation from the receptor. <clears throat> I'm just gonna tell you how you do that and for those of you that know pharmacology, uh, this won't be a surprise, but for the rest of you, you can understand mechanically how this is actually done. So for measuring affinity, I'm going to talk about competition, saturation and competition type assays. <clears throat> and so for all of these, you set up a series of tubes, each of which has some physiological buffer and tissue preparation. In years gone by, they would use homogenates from rat brain or cow brain, pig brain. Now we have cloned receptors, so we actually can have uh, immortalized cells which have been transfected, uh, which is sort of the biological term for infecting it with some new uh, DNA. Or we can take the human receptors, for example, and put them into any type of other receptor, uh, cell where they'll grow, and we actually have functioning receptors in those cells, which may or may not represent actual fidelity to what happens in the brain neuron with that receptor, but that's what people basically do to understand how these receptors are working. <clears throat> now for saturation assays, then we'll add increasing amounts of some radioactive drug to these tubes, which is believed to act or to bind to that particular receptor allow it to come to equilibrium, which can be anywhere from half an hour to hours, and then separate the radioactive drug that's bound to the receptor from that which is free in solution. So this is how that actually would work. Um, and nowadays, this is a, just a schematic representation. Nowadays, these assays are done in 96 or 384 well plates. So it's a plate about this wide, this long, and it has 384 little tiny wells or partitions. But this is what each well would basically do. So you have your receptor preparation, which would be typically a cell preparation that's been transfected with, in, in our, for our interest, the serotonin 2A receptor. It's homogenized and put into the buffer. And then we have a radioactive drug. We could use uh, tritiated LSD, for example, radioactive LSD. Put these two together and allow some length of time for incubation, and then filter it through uh, very fine, usually glass fiber filter paper. And that'll catch all the membrane particles that have the receptor and if they have radioactive ligand bound to them, they'll also be caught on the filter. The stuff that's not bound will wash through into the uh, solution, the filtrate. And you count these filters, usually dry them, put scintillation fluid on them, so you can measure the radioactivity. And knowing the specific activity, that is the amount of radioactivity you have in your ligand, you can calculate how much is here. You also know how much protein you added. So when you make these protein preparations, you know how many uh, femtomoles of receptor in there. So you can actually calculate, after you count the radioactivity, you can actually calculate how much radioactivity was bound. And when you increase the concentration of radioligand, you saturate it. You add more and more of these. So what you'll get is a curve where more and more of these receptors are bound to the radioactive ligand. <clears throat> and if you plot it out, it would look like this. Amount of bound radioligand over concentration. Here we have two drugs with two different KDs. And what you get is an exponential curve like this as you add more and more radioligand. And it approaches an asymptote, which is the total number of receptors that are available for binding. And that's called the B max, total number of binding sites. So these drugs have different KDs. This one, 
Um, the KD is approximately where we have 50% of the receptors occupied. <clears throat> this is a somewhat difficult calculation to do on these curves. They're usually transformed into nonlinear uh, least regression or scattered analysis where we can get that a lot uh, more easily. In fact, let me make sure my ringer is turned off. So you can see it takes a lot more of this one to reach this saturation point if we look at concentration than it took for this one. And then the Bmax. So you can get a KD, which is affinity, and, and, and Bmax in these saturation assays. So competition assay, now what you use a saturation assay for is to characterize that receptor preparation. So let's suppose you wanted to you look at 5-HT2A uh, uh, receptors from human. You transfect them into uh, some uh, cell line. You do this assay, and what you do is you find out how many of those receptors you actually got expressed in those cells and what the affinity of the ligand was at that receptor. <clears throat> the competition assay now is the useful assay. We only use saturation assays for characterizing the receptor in terms of Bmax and the affinity for standard ligand. Competition assays when we have unknown drugs and we want to see how well do they bind, and so they're in competition with the radioactive ligand for binding to this receptor. And this is the way this one would work. It looks very similar. We have the receptor preparation, we have radio labeled drug, and every test drug. Now in the saturation assays, we add increasing concentrations of radio labeled drug. In competition assays, we use the same amount. So we have the same amount of receptor preparation, the same amount of radioactive drug, but we add increasing concentrations of the non-radioactive drug because we want to see there's a competition. It's a law of mass action. We want to see how much of the radioactive drug is displaced when we increase the concentration. So after you incubate, you filter again, and now you'll have some number of radioactive molecules bound, but we'll also have some number of non-radioactive molecules bound, which have displaced some of the radioactivity. So you count it again, and now you'll get a displacement curve. If we think about the stoichiometry of this, imagine we have six units of receptor and 16 units of radioactive drug. So let's say that's a 16 nanomolar concentration. And this wouldn't be nanomolar. These receptor concentrations typically are in femtomolar or even picomolar, much smaller concentrations. But let's say we have six arbitrary units of receptor and 16 nanomolar radioactive ligand. And now we have three of these receptors, three of these units occupied. That's one half. So by definition, that's the Ka, the Kd, the affinity. So if half of these are occupied by 16 nanomolar, that means that the Kd is 16 nanomolar. Does everybody follow me? Raise your hand if you don't. <clears throat> so let's add, so now that's the radioactive drug. So now let's add an unlabeled, a non-radioactive drug, and we're going to add 6 nanomolar to it. So now we have, again, 6 units of receptor, 16 nanomolar concentration of our radioactivity and 6 nanomolar concentration of our non-radioactive drug. And now when we analyze how much of it is bound, we see of the 6 units of receptor we had, when we do the receptor binding and filtration, we see that only 2, two nanomolar of the radioactive ligand is actually bound in this case, whereas before we had 3 when there was no displacing ligand, so there's less. But now we have 2 units of the receptor occupied with the non-radioactive drug. So what would you say the KD, anybody, what would be the KD of this non-radioactive drug? It's the, sa it's the same. We have the same. So if it was 16 here, this is going, uh, the KD here is also going to be 16 now more. <clears throat> so now let's add more, add 12 nanomore, and now we see we have uh, essentially none of the receptor occupied by radioactive ligand, and all of it is cold, so even more is displaced. So by changing the concentration of the non-radioactive ligand, you get increasing amounts of displacement, and you can plot that out as a curve. So this is what a displacement curve would look like. These are some results that were done with chlorpromazine, which has, a, which has an IC50, which is almost synonymous. IC50 is a concentration that inhibits or blocks 50% of the radioactive ligand. So the IC50 of chlorpromazine is 2 nanomolar, and that's over here. Here's the 2 nanomolar. Here's the 50%, so this is half of the 
maximal. So we start with, if we have no displacing ligand in there and just radioactive ligand, we have maximal occupation of the receptors. Then as we start adding increasing concentrations of, of non-radioactive compound, we displace it. So this is what we would be reading off of that scintillation counter. When we're counting to see how much radioactivity is on the filter. And as we add increasing amounts of the non-radioactive ligand, it displaces more and more. And here are several drugs which are less potent, less able to displace drug A through D. And so what you can see is <clears throat> for drug D, if you actually plot this out, the 50% point here turns out to be 50 nanomolar. And drug A, which is even farther over here, the uh, IC50 is one micromolar, 10 to the minus 6 molar. So as these curves shift to the right in displacing, the drug is less and less potent in displacing a radioligand from the receptor. And you can do this with basically any type of G protein uh, coupled receptor. <clears throat> so just to summarize, saturation assay, each test drug has to be radio labeled. You have to, in order to characterize the tissue, you need a radioligand. So tritiated LSD or I-125 DOI or something like that. <clears throat> something that can be detectable at femtomolar to picomolar concentrations. And this gives a direct assessment of affinity, KD. Remember, affinity is KA, so KD is 1 over KD, only for convenience in discussing uh, what the affinity is. And that gives a direct estimate also of receptor density, maximum, Bmax, but maximum number of binding sites. And you have to do that for every receptor. So drug companies, for example, will have uh, rooms full of receptor preparations for every receptor they might be interested in. They've got radioactive ligands of all shades and sizes and colors for characterizing each of those. So depending on what their project is, they'll have a big robot that'll run these things, a 384 well plate and enough robots that'll just pipette these all automatically and can generate tremendous amounts of data on compounds with respect to affinity for particular receptors. And then the competition assay is where once we have characterized our receptor preparation, say a serotonin 2A receptor. The competition assays are done with unlabeled drugs. We want to know how active is the drug compared with the standard. So we made a bunch of LSD analogs in my lab, some of which had higher affinity than LSD. So this is one of the ways we characterize them. It gives an indirect assessment of affinity because we're displacing, we know the affinity of the radioligand and now we're displacing it. So these are actually called KIs when you do these competition assays. It's an inhibition constant which is approximately equal to KD, but since it's not a direct measurement, it's an indirect measurement, it's the KI. It's rapid and inexpensive. It's the primary screening method for CNS and other classes of drugs. So this is the first thing you would do if you had a series of drugs and you want to know how active they were at a certain receptor, what affinity. This is the simplest, least expensive assay if you've got, once you've got all the equipment. <clears throat> now the other issue is selectivity. Most drugs bind to lots and lots of different receptors. Uh, and it used to be the thought that you wanted a dr drug that for treating some therapeutic condition that was very specific for a particular receptor. And now that it, they talk about instead of a magic bullet, they talk about a magic shotgun. So for example, in treating schizophrenia, which is another uh, disease that I've worked on drugs for, they used to think it just found dr one drug that had one receptor activity and it would be really effective in treating schizophrenia. But actually, the drugs that are, that are used for treating schizophrenia bind to five or six or seven different receptors. And they don't really know which ones are doing what in terms of the overall activity. They just know that the best drugs have these m multiplicity of actions. So what about selectivity? So let's consider an example of three drugs. Uh, each has a KD of 0.1 nanomolar for the 5-HT2 receptor, but with additional affinity. So they're binding to the 2A receptor and also to the alpha-1 receptor. So they all three have 0.1 nanomolar affinity for the 5-HT2 receptor, and that's a very high affinity, 0.1 nanomolar. And then we have one that has two, one with 10, one with 100-fold selectivity versus alpha-1 adrenergic receptors. <coughs> alpha receptors are in the blood vessels. If you activate them, they cause uh, constriction of the blood vessel, raise the blood pressure. So some hallucinogen psychedelics have some alpha effects, so they can cause some increase in blood pressure. So here's a case where we have just a two-fold selectivity. So now if we look at receptor occupancy as we add increasing concentrations of drug, remember they all have this uh, 0.1 nanomolar affinity at the 5-HT2A receptor. And this is minus log, so minus log uh, 10 is 
10 nanomolar is 10 to the minus 10th molar. So minus log is a positive 10. So this is 0.1 nanomolar affinity. And now we have a two-fold selectivity for the alpha-1 receptor. And here is its, we go to 50% occupancy, here is its concentration. <clears throat> and what you see is when we have two-fold selectivity, at concentrations where the 5-HT2A receptor is 50% occupied, we have 30% occupancy of the alpha-1 receptor. And at concentrations of this drug where uh, we have 90% occupancy of the serotonin 2A receptor, we have 80% occupancy of the alpha-1 receptor. So two-fold selectivity is really not very good, especially if you consider that for drugs that activate the receptor, sometimes it only requires 1% re receptor occupancy or less. So this drug would not be very selective at all. What about tenfold selectivity? Here's the same situation, 0.1 nanomolar affinity at the 2A receptor, and now tenfold, one nanomolar affinity at the alpha-1 receptor. If we look at the same thing now, at the concentration where 5-HT2A receptors are 50% occupied, now the alpha receptors only are 10% occupied. And when serotonin 2A receptors are 90% occupied, the alpha-1 receptor is only 50% occupied, but still significant occupation. So again, a tenfold selective drug would not be considered very selective because you're still getting these off-target uh, receptor effects. Now, if we look at 100-fold selectivity, we see the same thing. Where the 5-HT2A receptor is occupied 50%, you see we only have a few percent occupancy of the alpha-1 receptor. And when we have 90% occupancy of the 5-HT2A receptor, we have 10% of the alpha-1. So 100-fold selectivity is considered the criteria for a selective drug, a minimum of 100-fold. So if you really, if you had a drug, and for example, LSD has high affinity at many, many different receptors. But if you had a drug that only had high affinity at a single receptor and nothing else was within a hundredfold, you would call that a very specific drug. And if it had a particular type of activity, you could say, that's probably what's doing it. It's that one receptor. And we don't have any drugs in the psychedelics like that. But that's sort of the concept of selectivity. <clears throat> and I'm not going to talk about all the other things the structure of the drug obviously determines whether it gets into the brain. There are lots of drugs that are very active in peripheral preparations, but they never get into the central nervous system, or they're uh, metabolized on first pass. Um, if you take something orally, a drug orally, after it's absorbed, the first place it goes is into the portal vein that goes into the liver. The liver is loaded with enzymes that chew up anything that's not supposed to be there. And so uh, that's called a first pass effect. So a lot of drugs that might be effective on a receptor preparation, if you actually administer them orally to an organism or human, they turn out sometimes not to be active because they never get to the brain or site of action. They may be destroyed completely in the, in the liver or they may have other properties, pharmacokinetic properties. Uh, there's drugs making the rounds now. You've heard of these n bone compounds, some of you. Those are very lipid-like, lipophilic drugs and they're not active orally, probably because they just get stuck in the tissues in the gut. And so people are using them by uh, uh, subcutaneous or uh, sublingual administration. But this is another factor that I won't spend any time on. But the whole concept of pharmacokinetics and the drug going from the site of administration to the site of action is a complex one. Talk very briefly about types of neurons in the brain. Um, in a basic physiology course, they'll talk about unipolar neurons where you have a cell body with a long axon that goes. So your pain, your proprioceptor neurons, pain receptors, things like that in the periphery are this type of neuron. They are very long axons that take that information and transfer it back to the spinal cord and up into the brain. But if we look in the brain, what you see is this is a cell from one of the thalamic nuclei. And they are very much different than this unipolar thing where you have a cell body and an axon and a, a terminal process. Somewhere in here, looked at it before, but I don't see it now. Somewhere in there, there's a little axon. But all these are dendrites that, that have uh, synaptic connections. So if you can imagine every one of these little places where it twists and turns, and actually if we blew it up microscopically, you'd see it's covered with uh, spines. Every one of those synapses with another projection from another neuron. 
So imagine in the brain, the brain is, is composed of cells like this, not like this. So this really adds to the complexity of the brain, which is probably the most complex organism that we know of, bio, 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 biochemical, whatever. Uh, probably <coughs> more, more complex than the fastest supercomputers in terms of what it can do. <coughs> and just another point to mention in terms of neurons. A lot of people think of neurons turning on or turning off. And it's not actually the case. In the brain, what you have is neurons are always firing at a characteristic rate. Uh, they don't cease in most cases unless in some cases you fall, you're asleep, for example. There may be neurons. But they fire at a, they have a, every neuron will have a basal rate that it fire, at which it fires. And if you apply an excitatory neurotransmitter, something like a glutamate, which is the most common excitatory transmitter in CMS, what you'll see is an accelerated firing. And similarly, uh, if you have a high basal rate, and you apply an inhibitory neurotransmitter like gamma aminobutyric acid or GABA, which is the most common inhibitory transmitter, you'll see a slowing of the rate. And I should also mention in this context, we talk about serotonin and dopamine and norepinephrine as being neurotransmitters, but they're not really the hard wiring. They really will adjust more than anything else the firing rate uh, through indirect means. The drugs that actually are uh, excitatory inhibitory are glutamate and GABA. So those are the things that really cause uh, neurons to turn off. Acetylcholine is another one, but I'm not going to talk about that. We're just going to focus on monoamines. And also the principle of temporal summation. Uh, those of you that know pharmacology or physiology know this already. Uh, if we put an electrode inside of a cell, and I'm not sure what happened on this graphic, but uh, if we have excitatory inputs into that and we measure the membrane potential, we'll see some depolarization. So we have a small depolarization. <clears throat> if we excite, increase the number of excitatory inputs uh, that turn on, and now we have the electrode, we may actually reach the threshold where we get an action potential. So this goes back to the slide with the thalamic cell that has all the dendrites on it. This kind of summation is going on over the whole cell to determine whether the cell itself fires. And then if you throw in inhibitory inputs, you can still have excitatory, but now if you have an inhibitory neuron start to fire, you see you can still suppress it. So this would be if the inhibitory neuron comes in and starts firing first, you would have actually have hyperpolarization. The membrane potential would increase, become more negative. And then if you turn on the excitatory inputs, then you would get some depolarization, but not necessarily an action potential. So this principle of temporal summation is that the cell is getting, at any one instant, is getting a whole bunch of excitatory and input and inhibitory inputs, and it's the sum of those that determines whether that cell actually generates its own action potential and fires. <clears throat> this graphic I made a while back, and I just thought it was cute, so you have to watch it. So this is the generation of, a, of an excitatory postsynaptic potential. So this is the little depolarization you see when you have excitation of the neuron, but it doesn't actually fire an action potential. And somebody was in here early and asked where the dog was. That's the dog. So what, what happened is we had slight depolarization here. Uh, the electrode picked that up, and then you saw the trace here where you get depolarization. Now this is generation of an action potential. So now we're going to have more of a release. So this again conceptually just means more release of transmitter onto this postsynaptic membrane. And now if you watch down here you'll see it will actually generate an action potential. There it fired an action potential. And now this actually that actually fires. So then we generate an action potential. I had, I had to show that. It took me so long to do that animation. <laughs> Those of you who have used PowerPoint probably know some of the pieces that are involved in making this go. <clears throat> so psychedelics activate the 5-HT2 type of G protein coupled receptor. And this is basically what's going on. Receptor mechanism of dummies. Here's serotonin. Here's the bundle. Serotonin comes down. There's a binding site in between helices 4, 5, 6, and 7. It goes down, it fits in. The protein adapts itself to the ligand. These intracellular pieces change. The alpha and beta gamma uh, 
subunits dissociate. The alpha subunit has got GDP bound, and when it dissociates, it binds GTP. And then uh, we get the alpha subunit, which then will interact with signaling uh, enzymes, for example, and the beta gamma, which will also interact with other signals. So that's what happens. And then after this GTP, uh, there's an intrinsic GTPase. That means there's an enzyme that breaks GTP back into GDP, and it's timed. And so at a certain point in time, the GTP is broken down into GDP for these. And once, the G once it's bound to GDP, it has high affinity for the receptor again. So it'll reassociate. So it will reinitiate that signaling cycle. <clears throat> in terms of what they do, what happens inside the cell, um, we have agonist, partial agonist, antagonist, and antagonist. These are classical examples. So a full agonist just means it does exactly what serotonin does. So at the 5-HT2A receptor, if we put serotonin in that preparation and we add a concentration sufficient to activate the receptor and we measure what happens inside the cell, and we say that's 100%. So this is 100% full activity. And then we put another drug in, and then we see what happens in the cell. Did we get the same magnitude of response we got with serotonin, the natural transmitter, or was it less? If it gave the same response, or sometimes greater, then it's called a full agonist. If it only gave a partial effect, it never did, even though we increased the concentration, it just goes on, it never goes up here, it's a partial agonist. And an antagonist does nothing. A silent antagonist does nothing. And if you, put a, if you put a silent antagonist in along with this agonist, what happens is you see a shift of this dose response curve. It's a parallel shift if it's competitive. And so <clears throat> this is what an antagonist would do. Now there's also an inverse agonist, which is not shown on here. Some receptors in the brain are already active and doing their business before you put any drug in there. And so if you put a silent antagonist in those receptors, nothing happens. But if you put an inverse agonist in, it actually changes the shape of the receptor so that it stops signaling. So if we had an inverse agonist here, if this is sort of the basal rate, and we put an inverse agonist in here, we'd see it would drop down here. And it's only recently that they've been looking at a lot of drugs that they used to think were silent antagonists that they now know are inverse agonists. Most of the drugs for treating schizophrenia they thought were antagonists, and they now know they're inverse agonists. It does the same thing. It occupies the receptor. It keeps the, the natural ligand from getting in there, but it shuts off any basal signaling or baseline signaling. <clears throat> so the receptor targets for psychedelics are the 2A and 2C receptors. For tryptamines, the 1A receptor is included, and LSD has lots of targets. And it used to be called... Uh, a promiscuous drug, and now they say LSD has rich pharmacology. And if you took a course in algebra and you had to solve a series of simultaneous equations, basically you could use the same kind of logic. And oops, if you look at this, you say, well, well what receptor is important? Well, the phenethylamines, mescaline, DOB, DOI, principally hit 2A and 2C receptors. The tryptamines hit those, but also activate the 1A receptor. And LSD hits those as well very potently, but hits the 1A, 1D, some of the D2 receptors, some of the alpha receptors. But if you say, what do psychedelics do? What do they have in common? What they have in common is this 2A, 2C. And they discovered early on in animal experiments by giving drugs that were antagonists, blocking the 2A and 2C receptors in animal models, they could block the effects of psychedelics in animal models by giving a 2A antagonist, but not by giving a 2C antagonist. And our illustrious colleague Franz Wollenweider gave ketanserin to humans before he gave them psilocybin and found also that the 2A antagonist could block the effect in humans. So it's pretty well pinned down that the 2A receptor is the principal target. That doesn't mean that these other receptors aren't important. The 1A receptor is involved in a lot of uh, different kinds of behavioral things like anxiety. Um, and so it may be involved in some of the effects of tryptamines. And LSD is much more potent in humans than it should be based on any of the receptor effects that we look at. So we have drugs that, <clears throat> we've made drugs in my lab 
that are much more potent than LSD in activating the 2A and or the 2C receptors. They're not quite as potent in humans and they're different. So presumably these other receptors are doing something, some, having some ancillary action. And that's one of the major foci of what I do now that I've retired from Purdue. I'm still focusing on trying to find what it is that makes LSD different. And we also have got drugs now that are highly selective for the 5-HT2A receptor that we're trying to explore. Yes? Yeah, yeah. LSD, for example, is an an it hasn't been published, but is an antagonist, for example, the f 5 d 7 receptor. So they could be agonist, partial agonist, or antagonist. We know at some of these, what the D4 receptor, we know that LSD is a full agonist. The D2, uh, I don't think these have actually been explored much. The problem is not many people have worked on LSD in the modern era. So uh, right now, at the present time, I've just uh, finished screening uh, 38 LSD analogs in a whole uh, receptor profile of, uh, I think, 30 or 40 different receptors. And we're starting to do functional assays, trying to find out, uh, because none of those other lysergic acid derivatives are as potent as LSD by far. So what is it that makes it different? So that's, that's a big question, because if we could discover that, that would tell us a lot more about the action of these drugs. So that's the necessary, but maybe not sufficient, receptor activation. <clears throat> um, now, I talked about what happens. The problem that came up, or it's made pharmacology much more complex recently, is a concept called functional selectivity. And instead of thinking about a receptor activating just one type of G protein, the 5-HT2A receptor, for example, uh, act was thought to activate the G-alpha-Q. So I have G-S and G-I, but there would be a G-alpha-Q here as well. These receptors can couple to these different other G-I and G-S, and also a receptor kinase can phosphorylate it, and they can associate with a restin that can cause receptor internalization and also additional signals. So instead of thinking about a receptor being activated and producing one thing inside the cell, we now have to think about well, what are all the different things in the cell. So one of the things we're looking at with LSD, for example, is which of these different signaling pathways does it turn on or does it block compared with um, other types of drugs that maybe are less potent. So this is a lot of work and there's no funding for this, obviously. Yes? So for the, for the same receptor, we get different signals. So what you have to think of, and this is a concept that seems so very obvious once you think about it, but no one thought about it until probably 10 or 12 years ago. So the receptor has evolved to accommodate, in the 5 ht 2 a for example, it's evolved to accommodate serotonin. So serotonin falls into the receptor, into the binding, fits into the receptor. And then the receptor accommodates itself to become complementary. And so that produces a certain conformation of the intracellular loops, which leads to some subset of signals. Now, you put LSD in there. LSD is a big tetracyclic rigid molecule. It binds, but the receptor cannot collapse to form the same complementary ensemble that it did with serotonin. So it forms some different receptor ensemble with LSD, and that changes the conformation of the loops inside. So the same thing for mescaline or DOI or DAB, anything you could think of. When it fits into the receptor, it's going to produce a different ensemble of the ligand bound to the receptor, and that will affect these intracellular loops that couple to the signaling proteins. Yes? Um, we're just talking about a 5 ht 2 a receptor in the membrane. Now, Yeah, okay, so in, um, in uh, cortical pyramidal cells, the 5-HT2A receptors are expressed in the apical dendrites, which is the piece that's just before the cell body. They also have alpha-1 receptors, and alpha-1 receptors respond to norepinephrine, and they actually share within the cells the G-alpha-Q signaling pathway. So there are other ways. So it could be some potentiation like that as well that's occurring with a different receptor. But as far as we know, all the G-protein receptors, all the GPCRs, now have multitudes of signaling possibilities. So there's not just one. So 
The drug companies, for example, for, for many years, just they did what's called high throughput screening. And they would have a 384 well assay where they would have something that would change color when the receptor was activated. And so they just said, okay, is the receptor activated? And that's not enough of an answer. Is it activated? No, which pathway is activated? So now you have to start looking at the various intracellular pathways to say, well, which one is activated? So maybe you have a drug that might be therapeutic if it turns on the formation of cyclic AMP, but it also activates beta restin and, and that internalizes and produces some other signals. And that's not relevant for the therapeutic effect. So you could get a drug that activates that one, but not the cyclic AMP formation. And you say, well, the receptor was activated, but it didn't work in our model. So it makes pharmacology more difficult. And the drug industry was resistant to this for a long time, but most of the good companies are realizing this is what's got to be done. In fact, most of the drug companies are getting out of CNS drugs completely. And you may have heard that. It's so expensive, and they don't know what the targets are. And you know, if you have like Alzheimer's, okay, there might be something you could look for. But for depression, anxiety, things like that, they just don't even know where to look for most of these. Schizophrenia is another one that's very difficult, very expensive. So most of the big drug companies are going for things that they can characterize more easily and not work in the CNS. So you can imagine academics, you, to get research to do work on psychedelics is like impossible. It's almost impossible today. NIDA funded me just because they wanted to know how these things worked. Um, and they funded another guy because he was giving data to the DEA to help them schedule things. But beyond that, there was nothing related to therapeutics. <clears throat> Uh, this is just two signaling pathways. We looked at uh, inositol phosphate accumulation and arachidonic acid release several years ago. Here's serotonin with dose response curves for both of those. Here's tryptamine, which is not a psychedelic, but you see it's a difference in terms of how much is produced of in the IP accumulation and how much in arachidonic acid. Here's LSD where it's reversed. More of the arachidonic acid was produced and less of the IP. And here's psilocin, which is the active green, uh, component from psilocybin. And the same amounts are produced, but the potencies are different. There's a shift here. This is just for two signaling pathways. <clears throat> and we initially thought that maybe arachidonic acid was important, so we looked at the ratio of arachidonic acid and IP accumulation. And LSD was 2, but then we had psilocin at 0.04, and methoxy DMT at 0.08, DOB. So that didn't work out for us. But the idea that there's a selective pathway that may be turned on is probably still viable if we can identify what that pathway is. And this is paper, uh, this is from a paper that we haven't been published because the postdoc who did it refuses to write up the method section. Um, if anybody knows Niels Jensen from Germany, tell him to get off his butt and write the methods up. I've sent him a couple emails. This is a great paper. <clears throat> we sent him a bunch of compounds. Here's a, here's a, DOI, uh, 2CB fly, TCB2, bromo dragonfly, bromofly, and uh, this is 25INBOH uh, instead of in BOM, but it's almost as potent. They're all phenethylamines. As you can see, they all have a structural relationship. And what he did is looked at uh, these eight signaling pathways. So formation of uh, NF-kappa B, a tra uh, transcription factor, C-jun, inositol phosphate turnover, arachidonic <laughs> acid release, increase in intracellular calcium, another uh, transcription factor, ERK and CREB. And for every one of these, there's basically a different fingerprint. And we actually, he actually looked at 20 or 25 different ligands. And what you see is this amazing difference in the fingerprint for all these. <clears throat> and if you look at tryptamines, they're different, so there's a chemo uh, uh, dependence on a chemotype. So you see, in general, this is a, you know what a heat map is. People understand how this is interpreted. Anybody who doesn't understand how this works? Okay, so let me go back to the previous slide. <clears throat> so um, this is based on negative log of the EC50. So the EC50 is the concentration that would turn that factor on halfway compared with the 100% response. And so this is the color value for PEC50. So this is uh, 10 would be the most potent. So this would mean that uh, well 9 would be 1 nanomolar. This would be 0.1 nanomolar would be the EC50. So something like this, this uh, what would be similar to the NBOM compound, this PERC here, it does, the, it's EC50 is 0.1 nanomolar for turning that on. 
And my sons looked this, at this in Drosophila, and it kills Drosophila. You may know that the enzymes have killed a couple people who probably overdosed. But uh, so this is the most um, most potent here. So if you look at this um, bromo dragonfly, the calcium very potent. Um, bromo fly also very potent, and the purple indicating it's not very potent in calcium or some of these others or serotonin. So this the the closer to this it gets, the more potent it is. So does everybody see that? So this is minus PEC50, so 0.1 nanomolar, 1 nanomolar, 10 nanomolar, 100, 1 micromolar. <laughs> Two-A receptor, yeah. And I, they're, um, I think they're maybe expressed in different cell lines because some of them don't express one. So I don't, this is what we don't know. We can't get Niels to write it up. But he looked at, um, he did this in Brian Ross' lab where I'm a, doing an indefinite sabbatical now. Um, so I get access to all the screening. So this is DMT, and um, Brian had a Schedule One license for DMT, but he didn't have one for psilocin. So Niels made ethyl methyl 4-hydroxy, which is an analog. Psilocin would just be a dimethyl here, so he made this as a non-controlled analog. <clears throat> so, and you see these basically are not nearly as potent in these pathways as the phenethylamines are. So what we did when, and, and then he also did some lysergamides. Uh, but nothing really exciting. Lysergamides even look different from the phenethylamines. So they said, when they got their screening, so what, do you, what are we going to do now? So why don't you do a regression analysis with all these uh, components and see which one gives the best correlation? And they, did, they didn't do that, but they did something very similar. And I said to Brian, I said, well, what, what best correlates with, we had rat drug discrimination data and rats trained to discriminate LSD. And we said, which one of these signaling pathways correlates best with the activity in drug discrimination. And it turns out it's calcium, intracellular calcium. But that can be increased by lots of things. And that's in rats. But we have no idea what happens in human brain and human neurons. So this complicates things even further. There is no magic bullet. There's nothing we can point to and say, well, that's what's doing it, because it does all these things. Yes? With uh, the... Uh, uh, ED50 and drug discrimination in rats trained to discriminate LSD. So that's the best assay we had. In, uh, you know, if we had if we had done something where all of these were red and blue, and we had one streak in the middle, which is almost like calcium, uh, back here you see also we have a lot of calcium. But then this compound, which is extremely potent. Uh, doesn't do anything to calcium. So it's way over here. At, uh, and also in the, so we didn't really see anything that stuck out. Calcium looks the best, but again, in drug discrimination, you, get, you can get false positives. So the rats pick up the effect of LSD, but that doesn't mean they're picking up the same thing that humans are picking up. They're picking up the activation of a 5-HT2A receptor. And that could be, it could just be the calcium that they're seeing. Now, this is a paper Tom Ray published in 2010. We sent a lot of compounds to Tom, and he got some others and had them screened at Brian Ross lab. He published a paper in PLOS in 2010. Just to point out, I talked about that 100-fold selectivity, that 100-fold ratio being the critical uh, cutoff. And what he's done is drawn lines here for the receptors where you see a 100-fold difference. So DOB, here's the serotonin 2B, the 2A, the 2C, and beta 2, and then you're at that 100-fold selectivity. So if you're talking about the in vivo effect of DOB, you're probably talking about an activation of one of these kinds of receptors. So the 2A is the one we think is there. 2C is activated by almost all of these. Beta 2, you know, that's an adrenergic receptor that occurs in the lungs. It dilates your lungs when you're in an emergency situation, fight or flight reflex. So you're trying to run, it dilates your lungs so you get more air in there. We don't know what a beta 2 receptor in the brain might do. And then DOI, which is just a substitution of an iodine for bromine, look at all the different receptors it hits before we get the 100-fold selectivity. And the 2A receptor is here. There's beta-2, alpha-2A, 5-HT2C. So there's a whole plethora of these. So the 5-HT2A receptor, I think, is necessary, but not necessarily sufficient. So if you look at all these substituted phenethylamines and you think about the different signaling pathways, <coughs> 
it's maybe not surprising that people have different responses and people characterize them in different ways because you're activating in some people uh, a lot of these other receptors which are changing the overall nature of the intoxication. So you turn it on by activating the 2A receptor, but then all these other ancillary receptors potentially could be involved. <coughs> so in structure activity, yeah, you have enough? There, <coughs> for the 2A receptor, I don't know that there are any identified isoforms. <coughs> for the 2C receptor, there are some edited isoforms that involve editing in the intracellular loops. But um, I don't know that the serotonin 2C receptor is important for the psychedelic effects. If it was, you probably would expect to see some differences there. But uh, I don't think for the 2A receptor. Yeah, and one. Yeah, and it's one side, isn't it? One, it's one polymorphism. Yeah. <coughs> oh, the promoter, in the promoter region. But nobody has studied that for two A receptors. But really, in terms of. Look at the. I don't think there's anything di different in the structure. There is RNA editing in the 2A or 2C, and then if the polymorphism in the promoter. You might have different expression, but the receptor itself, I don't think so. <coughs> so, just in terms of structure activity relationships, I thought I would just talk to you about the different forces that are involved in binding to a receptor. And in general, we think of similar structures having similar pharmacology. <coughs> that isn't always true, but uh, if you look at this, here's a, s a structure of morphine, levorphanol, alpha protein, codeine, nalorphine, levolorphine, fentanyl, naloxone, and phen phenazacine. You see they have a similar structure, and if they have different structures, we tend to think the pharmacology is different. <coughs> so cocaine and atropine both have this tropane ring. They're both esters at this position. Cocaine's a methyl ester, atropine has nothing. And there's also this, uh, this uh, darkened bond versus the hash bond, which means it's pointed up toward the reader here or down. You see they still have this tropane ring, but these are different molecules. Cocaine and atropine have different pharmacology, even though in a two-dimensional way they look similar. So those of you who look at two-dimensional structures, you look at them and they say, well, they look similar, but they're not really similar. And what you have to do is imagine what they look like to the receptor. So these are minimized forms of cocaine and atropine with the uh, van der Waals surfaces and then with the electrostatic charges plotted on there. So red is high electron density. So oxygens, here's the nitrogen atom here that's got a pair of electrons. So they, you try to imagine, if you look at two structures, you try to imagine what they actually look like. <coughs> so in terms of the forces that are involved in drug, drug receptor binding, and I'm still talking about binding and not activation. Most of the studies that have been done have been done just with affinity, and not a lot has been done looking at receptor activation for most cases. We are doing that now with the current LSD series that we've got. We're looking at uh, activation in two different pathways. So the strongest forces are electrostatic, and going all the way down to pi cation forces as the weakest charge transfer. I'll show you what these are. <coughs> So electrostatic are the strongest. They operate over the longest distance. And typically we think about the charge of the receptor being attracted to the charge of the ligand. And most of these ligands are amines, the LSD, DOB, et cetera. They're protonated in means at physiological pH. So there's an attraction between the ligand. In this case, it's probably a carboxylate in helix 3 of the receptor. But this is like sodium chloride. These are ionic forces, and they're the strongest. And you have polarization forces where you have an ion dipole or dipole dipole. Hydrogen bonding would fall into this category. So these are second in strength. So in the receptor, we have a lot of polar residues, serine residues, asparagines, things that are polar. So they form uh, good dipole dipole interactions. Um, also, people talk about hydrophobic bonding. There is no such thing as hydrophobic bonds. What happens uh, in solution if you have a lipid-like molecule, LSD, 
very hydrophobic molecule tends not to be very water soluble. <coughs> so around the molecule, what is the what does the water do when it comes in contact with that molecule? Because there's no attraction. So what happens is you get one or two layers of water stacked up around it that are called ordered water, where you have hydrogen bonding. So you can see this kind of ordered here. And the same thing within the receptor, you get ordered water there. Whenever things are kept in an orderly fashion, the energy of the system goes up because it takes energy to keep it ordered. So when the drug interacts with the receptor and binds, it displaces the water that was structured around the drug and structured in the receptor and releases it into the bulk solution. And that increased uh, disorder is called increased entropy and the energy of the system uh, goes down because you're no longer requiring energy to keep this ordered water there. So hydrophobic binding really, it's, it's a powerful driving force for interaction, but has nothing to do with the water. Uh, it just it displaces the water and that's where your energy comes from. <coughs> <coughs> and dispersion forces, or London or Van der Waals forces, are weak forces. If we imagine a chain of carbon atoms, electrons are not discrete particles. They're described by wave functions. So at any given time, the electron can be more or less any place within that atom or molecule. And so if we generate a transient partial positive charge, say the electrons are pulled away, then it generates, a, there's a dipole-dipole interaction, it generates a complementary negative partial negative charge there, so pull electrons to, to it. So what I've tried to do is illustrate a chain of carbon atoms that have sort of instantaneous charges. If you could freeze this at one, you know, femtosecond or whatever and, and look at the actual charge distribution, it would be, it wouldn't be uniform, it would be all over the place. And if it's close to another molecule, you would get, uh, you would induce complementary charges. So this is important for big hydrophobic molecules. LSD is a big hydrophobic molecule. So there are a lot of these kinds of forces that are developed when it gets into the receptor that help to hold it there. Tra charge transfer. Charge transfer uh, <coughs> forces. Basically. Why is this doing this? When you have two aromatic rings, behaving badly now. When you have two aromatic rings, if they approach each other face to face, especially if they have, uh, if one is more electron rich than the other, they will uh, interact with each other. And you can envision there's sort of a weak current that would flow between them that sort of stacks them. Imagine the electron clouds on the benzene ring as being like the filling in a sandwich and these two would approach each other. They don't actually line up, they're offset a little bit. So I'm trying to illustrate face to face. But you can also have edge to face interactions where one ring will come in and interact this way. And you see a lot of these pi pi interactions in protein structure, but it's also important in the receptor. So in the 5-HT2A receptor, there are two phenylalanine residues, 339 and 340, which engage the ligand. 340 especially engages the ligand in an edge-to-face uh, charge transfer or stacking interaction. And the uh, pi cation, <coughs> um, acetylcholine esterase is the best example of this. Whenever you had a charged molecule, acetylcholine is a charged molecule, but a charged amine would be the same. People used to think that you had to have a carboxylate, so you had another counter ion to balance it. But in acetylcholine esterase, uh, which has a charged uh, nitrogen with some alkyls, three alkyls around it, they found out in the enzyme that it actually was sequestered by these aromatic rings, phenylalanines and tryptophans, because aromatic rings have high electron density. So you have a positive charge, which is electron uh, deficient, being s sandwiched in between two electron-rich rings, and so it stabilizes a pi, pi cation. <coughs> Um, steric effects are something that are non-continuous, um, and it's just useful to be aware of what they are. Medicinal chemists uh, usually uh, use steric effects as what we call a hand-waving exercise, and I'll show you why. Suppose we have a drug that has something attached here, and we have an unsubstituted benzene ring, and that, that molecule is active. And now we 
substitute a methyl in the meta, meta position, in the three position, and it becomes more <laughs> potent. But if we put the methyl in the four position, it's less <laughs> potent. And how can you explain something like that? There's no rhyme or reason for that because electronically these two methyls are the same. In terms of their solubility in lipid, their fat solubility, they're going to be basically the same. So medicinal chemists will hand wave and say, oh, it's probably a steric effect. <coughs> and we've encountered this at various times in some of our work, work where we add something onto a molecule, it becomes inactive. You say, well, it's probably some kind of a steric effect. And if you imagine you've got a protein target and there's a binding site, there actually may be a place over here that can accommodate this methyl. There may be van der Waals interactions with, uh, say, alanines or leucines or something here that actually make it bind better and make it more potent. But if you put the methyl down here, there's some kind of a restriction. The protein has a three-dimensional structure so that it can't fit. So when you see something like this, uh, more potent and less potent, it doesn't make any logical sense than a steric explanation, some kind of steric effect. <clears throat> okay, let's stand up and take a breath, and I'm going to put part two in uh, after we take a short break.